Mike Mallon of the Ultrasound Jacob Avila Podcast. Of the, also of the Ultrasound Podcast. <laughs> hey, we have some news to share with you guys. Uh, now, it's not super good news from our point of view, but it's for sure like the right thing to do with this uh, crazy situation that's like developing over the entire world um, over the course of what, like two or three months? Like it just started. It's crazy. The insanity is definitely happening, but the reality is that we really need to uh, postpone Castle Fest. Um, and there's really no way around this. The, 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 there's nothing, no good right now can come of getting, you know, 120 physicians that are on the front lines in a small room with one another sharing bourbon. So unfortunately, yeah, I, I, I think this is the reality, Jacob. Yeah, I know. It's, I mean, and we've been kind of like monitoring this situation, trying to see, you know, how does this look? But it, it seems like, you know, the right thing to do is to assume that this is not going to be completely blown over by the time that May rolls around. It's not respectful to the medical community, to the world as a whole, and um, I think not realistic. So good news, though, we are not canceling Castle Fest. What we're doing is we're just going to kind of move it to November. It's the week of the 9th of November is when the new date is. So it's going to be the same setup, um, most, if not all of the same instructors, same content. We're just moving it to the fall, which fall in Kentucky, hmm, it's actually not bad. No, it's beautiful. It's It's great. It's It's not bad. It rivals rivals spring. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Yeah. No no winter and no summer for sure. But, uh, but, but fall and spring are pretty nice. I've been there both times. So it'll be first time we've ever done Castle Fest in the fall. It'll be fun. So we'll change that on the Castle Fest website. Um, hopefully everybody can make it in November instead of May. Um, again, awesome time to be in Kentucky. So in addition um, to postponing Castle Fest, because of all this COVID drama, we've decided to make all of the lung content for Ultrasound Leadership Academy free to anyone. So uh, what we're doing right now is we're setting that up. By the time this recording gets released, it should be available at www.ultrasoundleadershipacademy.com. Go there, sign up, free lung content for everybody, trying to do our best to educate everyone on the advantages of ultrasound and and the diagnosis and the treatment of COVID. Yeah. And right when we're done with this announcement, we are going to be just immediately after this, you don't have to do anything else, just continue watching. Um, One of the videos, which is um, how we scan the lungs, uh, will be there to kind of show you what kind of content that is. So hopefully um, watch this video and then go and see the rest of it on ultrasoundleadershipacademy.com. All right. Thanks, Jacob. The last section of the basic pulmonary module is going to be how to bring it together. We're going to talk about how to utilize lung ultrasound in your daily practice. The history and physical exam is important, but as far as the majority of the literature goes, ultrasound is better than the chest x-ray physical exam history and labs. That's better than most of the things that we do at baseline as a whole. However, you must remember that ultrasound is a tool to use. It's not necessarily the only test, and honestly, it's not always the best in every situation. Ultrasound should be used in conjunction with all the other tests you and I have in the emergency department. Now, this is how I scan the lungs. I work in an academic center, and how I usually approach lung ultrasound is first I either perform an HMP, or more often, I will get a history presented to me by a medical student, advanced practice practitioner, that's PAs and MPs, or residents. Then after that, I decide what I think the patient's most likely differential diagnosis is in order. I then start by scanning the area in which that particular pathology is most likely to be present. So if I think the patient is more likely to have interstitial disease, so B lines, or a pneumothorax, I'm going to start by scanning in the anterior chest looking for those things. If I think the patient is more likely to have something like an effusion, like a consolidation, like an embolism, I'm going to start in the back of the lungs because that's where that pathology is most likely to be present. I've alluded to it already, but the probe I usually use is a curvilinear transducer. This one is a good general use probe for the lungs. If you bring the depth way shallow and the gain way down, you can actually see lung sliding pretty easily, even though the linear probe is probably the best one for that. Additionally, I think the higher frequency relative to the phased array or cardiac transducer makes this much more advantageous to the lung. There is a little bit of a downside. The footprint of the curvilinear transducer when you place it 
transverse to the ribs can have a lot of rib shadows. They can kind of get in your way, but you can easily get around that by turning your transducer parallel to the ribs. And I'll show you what that looks like. As far as how to approach the lung systematically, you can do an eight zone method, or you can do up to a 28 zone method, looking like every single rib space. The 28 zone method would work if you have a whole lot of time to spare. I usually don't. So what I do is try to simplify it. I have a three zone technique. I look in the anterior chest, the lateral chest, and then the posterior chest. This is actually super important. A lot of people forget that a lot of lung pathology, especially pneumonia, is gonna be more likely to be present back here. The lung, remember, goes all the way up here. You can't image behind the scapula, but that's okay. You can still see a good amount of the lung back here. I found quite a few pneumonias tucked back here that I might not have seen if I hadn't been more diligent. Now, what I'm doing when I'm scanning the lungs for pulmonary pathology is I'm basically doing pattern recognition. I'm looking at this. So I'm looking at rib, rib, pleura, and I wanna know, does it look any different than this? This is what in my brain is normal. And if I see anything other than this nice white line, I'm gonna stop and look a little more in depth. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say I'm gonna start on the anterior chest and I'm basically gonna sweep side to side. Start, go all the way to the sternum, then go to the about anterior axillary line, back and forth on both sides. The reason I like this curvilinear transducer is because I can see multiple rib spaces at a time looking at that white line. And this is how I do it in the back. I'm gonna go all the way down until I find the abdomen. So right here, we're seeing the spleen and the kidney. I go up one rib space and then just lawnmower back and forth, back and forth, all the way back and forth to the posterior axillary line. Don't forget, all the way up here is actually lung tissue as well. All the way up here is lung tissue. So I still look all the way up there. Now let's say I'm over here in the lateral chest and I find something weird. So let's say right here, I'm like, oh my gosh, I see a abnormality in the section right here. So once I find something that doesn't look like this normal white line here, then I, I turn it. So I kind of think about it as when my probe marker is up and I'm scanning multiple rib spaces at a time, that's like the coarse tuner in the microscope. And then I turn it to be parallel to the ribs and that becomes my fine tuner. So what I'll do now is I'll find that rib space and I'll just rotate my probe until all I see is that particular rib space. And then I'll fan within that rib space to make sure that I have the best image of whatever pathology I happen to see in that area. And that is how I scan.